Now, these are the most important. Today and tomorrow, we'll just take one of them today. And uh, uh, these are the most important. These are very common, and I'll tell you where they are in South Carolina. Uh, we call they're, they're all dimorphic fungi, which means what? Two forms. In the uh, nature, they're in a mycelial form. In tissue invasion, human or animals, they are in a yeast form. Uh, they're called endemic mycoses because most of them are in limited geographical areas, which we'll discuss with each one. They have a specific ecological niche. You're wondering why I was talking about these things before, but it'll come out now in these next few lectures. They all cause, cause systemic infections, and they are morphologically distinct, easy to identify. Well, not real easy, but fairly easy. I'm going to talk to you first about blastomycosis. And I have up here, if any of you want more than you want to know about blastomycosis, uh, a chapter I wrote on it. And you can, you can have these. I'm going to discard them anyway because we've got a new edition coming out. Uh, but uh, the, everything in there is still true. Uh, and blastomycosis is, uh, I, I actually, I spent my life with this disease. Uh, you know what this is? That's a beaver hut. The beavers make this hut and they live underneath it. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. Because this was the first time that we had an association of isolation of an organism from nature and 96 kids that were infected with the disease. And that was up in northern Wisconsin. It's a chronic, separative, and granulomatous disease of any tissue with a predilection for lung, skin, and bones. Now, I'm going to tell you all these predilections on these things, but it doesn't mean you can't get any. You can get CNS disease with this. Uh, you can get abscesses. You can get any type. You can get uh, uh, genital diseases with these, but primarily we see it as a pulmonary infection and the skin, and then secondarily, prostate and bone. So you ladies are spared again. You can't get any prostate infections. Inhalation and inoculation. 99% is inhalation. Inoculation sometimes occurs with trauma where somebody's digging up something and the well, there have been cases where they're digging up trees and the roots go through somebody's foot and penetrate, just like the others, and they'll get a cutaneous. Veterinarians, uh, once in a while, will get an infection. They'll cut themselves. Pathologists will cut themselves doing an autopsy. But these are really rare, but it can occur. And for some reason, um, when the pathologist gets a nick and develops a lesion, these things are really self-limiting for the most part. They don't need any treatment. Just watch them, and they'll eventually heal. It'll take months, but they'll eventually heal, even though uh, systemic uh, blastomycosis can be a bad disease. The systemic is usually pulmonary, and cutaneous can be primary or secondary. What I described to you about the pathologist or the veterinarian that's called primary. In other words, you get a direct inoculation. But what also happens is people with a pulmonary infection will develop cutaneous lesions as it disseminates. And in fact, on some patients, they won't even realize they have the pulmonary infection. They break out and they go to the doc because they have the skin lesion. And then if you work back, again, it's unfortunate. It takes a long time to develop. You can't always identify the primary uh, source of the type of pneumonia, but in some cases, for some reason, you can document a pneumonia in the patient or say, yeah, doc, I had a bad cold or something like that. So that's uh, secondary, and, and that's common, secondary cutaneous lesions. This is what a lung will look like. It'll look like tuberculosis. And the symptoms are anorexia, weight loss, cough, 
hemoptysis, night sweats, and what's the first thing you're going to think about in disease? What? TB. And you're going to work the patient. Many times, uh, most docs, when they first see the patient, they'll get a sputum culture and they'll say fungus and TB. Do both. You've got to say fungus because when you work it up for TB, the lab will not isolate the fungus. You've got to say, I want a fungus culture because then they have to do different procedures to get the fungus to grow. This is a very unfortunate patient. Uh, he came to MUSC. The heart of um, blastomycosis probably is North Carolina. It was first described there, and uh, Duke was a big, no, I'm talking about like the 1940s and 50s. Duke was the great place uh, for diagnosing blastomycosis. This patient came from North Carolina. Nine years he went around different physicians and never got diagnosed. By the time he got to MUSC, he had strictures on the legs, so there, his legs were bent like this. He was in a wheelchair, couldn't walk. Uh, he had these penetrating lesions, and in fact, on the other side, it penetrated through the skull. Uh, the eye, you see his eyelids and all that, everything's gone. He was blind. And he had blastomycosis. Uh, the material you sent to the lab is skin scrapings, sputum, pus, biopsy material, urine. A lot of times, why, why urine? Where, what, what is this, one of the places this organism goes? Prostate. So urine cultures. That's why it's important to remember the prostate can be infected because you say, hmm, I'm going to take a urine culture. Uh, it's, ecological association has not been 100% identified. Uh, but it's mostly organic debris. It's only been isolated from nature uh, about eight or ten times. Uh, soil, rotted wood, decayed vegetation, that's where you, you find it. And it's a disease of right here in the eastern United States. That, that's all the blastomycosis. Louisiana has a good bit. But look at South Carolina here, see? The upper part. Um, I have another slide of that, I believe. There have been nine outbreaks. Mostly, there's a lot here. And North Carolina, where most of them. An outbreak doesn't mean contagion. Now, an outbreak means they've all been exposed to what we call a point source. They were all together. And uh, uh, this one up at the top there, Big Fork, the only reason we know how that happened uh, was because these bunch of families, well, three or four families, were building a house in the country out of logs. They didn't live in the same part of the city, and yet people from the different families. That's what we call an outbreak. Uh, on this um, uh, Eagle River, no, Hayward, was uh, two groups of canoeists came down two different rivers, the rivers came together, and at that point, there was a clearing area where there were a lot of dead wood where people would camp. Now, these two groups didn't know each other, came from different places. They both camped there the same night and made fire out of these rotten logs, and the two groups came down with um, blastomycosis. That's what an outbreak is like. The, um, uh, another, I showed you that uh, beaver hut. An Eagle River, uh, a bunch of kids went, they had this nature place way out in the woods, and there was a beaver hut, and 92, I think it was 92 children and four teachers all got blastomycosis from tromping on the hut, and that's when we isolated the organism from the, uh, that was the first time we isolated an organism from nature and from the patients. Now, in South Carolina, we find most of the cases, uh, I did this in 1988, 
62 cases, uh, came from up north here. Do you know what that line is? That's the fall line. Do you know what the fall line is geogra geologically? We don't know what it really means. I mean, this is really important. But it's where the Ice Age came down and dropped all the boulders and rocks. That's why you have the early migration to U.S. People came up, landed here on the shore, and went up the river as far as they can go. That's why you have Augusta, Georgia. That's why you have Columbia, South Carolina, Chiraw, Roanoke, Virginia, and on up. That's the fall line. Now, it just so happens, and I don't know if that's really meaningful. We have this five here, but that five is they all came from MUSC, and we did not have a real residence on them. The only information we can get was that they, they were at MUSC. So for some reason, this uh, north uh, northwestern part of the state is where you see it mostly. Only recently, uh, they've pretty much identified a virulence factor. It's called BAD1. I don't expect you to remember it, but that's, uh, uh, it's real important in, in, the, uh, in this disease. Oh, and was discovered by the same people with that, uh, where all the kids got exposed at Eagle River, because our epidemiologists here, we get a, a training epidemiologist from CDC every couple of years. The fellow who came here for training went up to Wisconsin and became the state epidemiologist in Wisconsin. And he was taking a trainee some several years later. That young trainee got so interested in that case, we worked together on it, and he became an uh, uh, infectious disease uh, physician and went on. He's doing tremendous molecular research, and he discovered that uh, BAD1. So you never know what's going to happen in your life. Uh, blastomycosis is dimorphic. This is a culture, and this one's probably... Uh, at that size, about four or five weeks old. It's a loose, white, cottony material. Of course, we grow these at two temperatures, right? 37 and 25 degrees. If we look at it microscopically, we see these tiny microconidia. They don't mean anything as far as identification goes. They don't help us. But then we convert it to the yeast form. How do we convert it to the yeast form? Grow it at 37 degrees, right. And the yeast is a tannish, brown, buttery, soft colony, and you pick it up like bacteria. Now, here's the important point. When we look at it, microscopically, we see the yeast forms, naturally. They have single buds, single buds, they have a wide base. By the base, I mean here where the bud comes off this part. And this is going to be important when we look at some of the others. A wide base, and they have this double contour that looks, it's called a double wall. It's not really a double wall, but that wide contour. Typical, diagnostic, no problem, okay? Yeast form, that's just a little characteristic, uh, a drawing. 8 to 12 microns in diameter. Now, here's a piece of tissue. Uh, this patient had bone infection. Here's the granulomatous reaction. Here's a yeast cell. See the bud? Little bud on there. And uh, there's another one down here. Okay, granulomatous reaction. In the very beginning, the histology is an acute separative reaction. Polys. And then as it matures, it goes into this chronic phase with the granulomatous reaction. I think I mentioned this the first hour. This patient, this is that 75-year-old farmer who came down here from Spartanburg, got diagnosed by uh, just scraping the skin. And this is what was seen in the wet mount. And again, you see the characteristic double wall, wide base, single bud. So that, that was easy in a wet mount, KOH. Eat, eat the KOH a little bit. 
we have uh, three serological tests. Complement fixation. Now, I'm going to talk about complement fixation several times in these next hour with these other dimorphic infections. Uh, complement fixation was our only test for many years. The problem is they all sort of cross-react with each other. So you've got to have some more patient history uh, to make a diagnosis. Another problem is they can take anywhere from four weeks to a couple of months to develop. I'll demonstrate this in a moment. Immunodiffusion is much better. You get uh, a precipitin band, and that can come up in about two weeks. The other side of the coin is uh, sensitivity. Did I put sensitivity in your notes? It's low, and specificity is high. If you get a positive test, it's blastomycosis. But most patients don't. Uh, I would say most patients, a lot of patients don't react to it. The EIA is looking better. There hasn't been enough experience to make any general statements on it yet. EIAs in general are better tests for all the fungi. Uh, Itraconazole is used if the uh, infection is mild, pulmonary infection, mild, one or two skin lesions, and the uh, uh, Etraconazole will usually cure this. If not, then you go back to amphotericin. Voriconazole, I mentioned before with the uh, aspergilli, is a newer drug. It's showing very good promise, low toxicity, and uh, fairly effective. So we have to see what time does, but right now, voriconazole is it. You, m many of these patients will wind up getting amphotericin if they have a relapse. Now, this is a patient from northern Georgia. He came in. Here's his skin lesion. And he came in because of the cutaneous lesions. But with a lot of history taken, it turned out he had pneumonia uh, about uh, a year before this occurred. And looking at it from the side, typically, this is not a real typical lesion. Uh, typically, the blastomycosis cutaneous lesions will heal in the center and they have little pustules at the end, at the edge of the periphery of the lesion. So what you as a physician do, you take your little trusty scalpel, your slide, and you drop a KOH, you nick one of those uh, little abscesses, and you make that wet mount, and you look at it, and you see the typical single budding, wide base, double walled E cells. This fellow got his amphotericin B, that's all we had at that time, that was in the 50s. Uh, I notice it's not a good picture. Here's his ear and his nose. I got it too close up, but anyway, the, the lesions all, all healed. But he was in the hospitals for several months. Well, a couple of months anyway, getting it. Okay, we'll stop there, and then we'll finish up tomorrow with the rest of the dimorphics and then the opportunistic infections. We'll cover all 300 species in 30 minutes tomorrow.